The video was absolutely shocking. A teenager from New Mexico pulling up to a dumpster, stopping, getting out of the car with her newborn wrapped up, and tossing the child into the dumpster. That baby survived, and now that child's mother is in prison. This next video was even more shocking because of where it is. A teenager running down the hallway of a hospital, then going into the bathroom. After she exits that bathroom, a cleaning woman goes inside and discovers a lifeless newborn covered in the trash. That teenager is now charged with murder. For years, we have seen cases involving young mothers accused of crimes when their babies are discovered, discarded in the trash. But tonight, we will look at the other side of these tragic cases, the fathers. First in Georgia, an Amber Alert is issued when baby Josiah is reported missing by his father. Then as the investigation develops, investigators find Josiah's remains discarded in a garbage transfer station. And his father now charged with murder. Tonight, we will bring in our experts to look at cases of filicide where the father is the accused killer. But first, we will speak with the two people who loved and miss baby Josiah the most, his mom and his grandma. All this as we investigate fathers accused of killing their babies. I'm Vinny Politan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is gonna be a difficult hour. It always is when we talk about children and children who look to their parents for everything and end up being killed, murdered by their parents. Um, you know, many of these stories, for whatever reason, like one we just uh, previewed for you there in the opening of the show, involve dumpsters like babies in dumpsters, and it's actually a thing. It's actually a thing. So when you, when you hear the story, um, you don't say, oh, I can't believe it. You say, not again. And that's, obviously it's sad, it, it's tragic, it's, it's, but it, it's, it happens. And trying to understand why is difficult. And we're going to spend some time tonight talking about all of these issues. But like I said, when, next time you hear that story, that headline, you're not going to say, I can't believe it. You're not. You're going to say, not again. Not again. Even though today, parents have so many options. And, and the circumstances are, are always varied. There's some common denominators. Sometimes it's a hidden pregnancy. You don't want anyone to know, you even told your parents, you, haven't, you know, you're a young mother and you don't want anyone to know. I remember one of the original ones was the, the, the prom mom who gave birth at the prom. And it, it's hidden for, you know, whatever reasons, the, the reasons of, 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 I don't want to get in trouble, um, the shame, the this, I don't know what to do, I'm confused, all of that. But now there's so many options where any, any young parent, no matter how young, can drop their babies at safe havens, no questions asked. No questions asked, no, no arrest. You don't get in trouble. Because we, as a society, realize that this issue is going to happen again and again and again, and we want to provide as many potential options for all the circumstances to try to save the life of the child. And it's, it's easy to say, yeah, well, if you don't want, if you're going to carry the baby, you don't want the baby, you can give the baby away for adoption. But I, maybe it's a hidden pregnancy. So there are there are these options, like firehouses and other places. And when we talk about this, you know, often we, we talk about the moms. As a matter of fact, I think almost exclusively through the years when we talk about children who are discarded in the trash, it's always the mothers we're talking about. Whether it's, it's, it's these two that we featured in our open. I remember doing a story about little baby Gabriel. 
um, who was also believed to have been thrown in a dumpster, in the trash, discarded like garbage. But we're always talking about the moms. Tonight, it, it's the dad's turns. Okay, so we're going to talk about the fathers. Because it's not exclusive to the mothers that, that this happens. There are times, and tonight we've got uh, a couple of stories that we are going to talk about. Where it's the father who's accused of taking his child and putting his child in the trash. Now, for those of you who are parents, grandparents, this is unthinkable. It's unthinkable for all of us, which is why we have to sort of get into the minds of those who would do this to try to understand why and how, and is there a way to prevent it? Is there, are there signs that are out there of someone who could potentially do this? What do we say? How do we react? So let's begin with the, the story of little Josiah. Because um, I have a timeline for you. I want you to take a look at it so you understand what happened to... My goodness, look at this guy. Two years old. That's the age when... That's when the personality really starts to, to, to blossom and, they, and, and children become... I call them like little people, right? They're not just babies. They're like little people because they're reacting and, and, and that personality is coming through. So August 16th, He's reported missing. The next day on the 17th, police say that Josiah's father, Artavius North, reported that someone kidnapped Josiah during an armed robbery. So that's the father's story. Okay? Oh, there's an armed robbery. Somebody kidnapped my child. Um, on the 17th, police say the same day, no kidnapping occurred. And North is charged with making false statements and false report of a crime. That's always the initial charge. The initial charge. It was the same thing in the Casey Anthony case. False statements to police. False reporting. Uh, on the 18th, uh, crews searching for the child drained uh, a small lake at the apartment complex where Josiah was last seen. And then they started to search a nearby landfill. On the 20th, Josiah's family members searched the apartment complex and passed out missing flyers. They were desperate. They were heartbroken. They were panicking and wanted to find little Josiah. Then it's the 23rd, three days later, that his remains were found at the East Point Garbage Facility Transfer Station. Let that sink in for a second. That face, someone looked at that face and said, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to put you in the trash. August 31st, 31st, Artavius North is charged with malice murder, concealing the death of another and cruelty to children, the most serious of all charges in Georgia. So let me bring in my first guest to talk about this in Akron, Ohio, uh, a philicide expert and staff psychiatrist, Dr. Sarah West is with us. Um, Dr. West, great to see you tonight. Um, mothers versus fathers, how common is this? Mothers versus fathers, how, how is that breakdown generally? I would say it's approximately 50% mothers versus fathers, but I believe that the mothers tend to make the news a lot more, as you mentioned. Um, the interesting thing about fathers when compared to mothers is that they tend to be punished more harshly. Uh, and I'll say that oftentimes the fathers will also annihilate the whole family. So this is a bit of an unusual case, kind of statistically speaking. So what you're saying, usually when a, when a father is killing a child, it's, it's, we're taking out the whole family. We're taking out mom, siblings, everybody's gone. Um, and, and in those scenarios, how often do they take their own lives? Quite often, actually. That's a very good point. So yes, after annihilating the family, the fathers will often follow in suicide. So let, let's, let's talk about how and... and 
how someone could get from point A to point B, because we're looking at those pictures, and we can keep those up on the screen, those, those photographs, so we understand um, this child. I mean, this, this child, this age, the innocence, the look in their eyes when they look at mom and dad, um, every parent that's watching right now understands that look and knows that look and knows at two years old is when, you know, 18 months to two years old is when the personality is blossoming. How, how does that notion form in, in someone's mind that I am going to take the life of this child and then number two, discard that child like trash, literally like trash. Great questions. And if we take a look at motive, uh, my mentor personally, Dr. Philip Resnick, published a landmark article in the 60s, really focusing on three, excuse me, five reasons why parents might do something like this. Um, there's the idea of altruism. If a parent believes something's wrong with their children, uh, they may try to eliminate them because they don't want them to suffer. There's psychosis. There's spousal revenge, the idea that they may be trying to get back at their partner or the other parent of the child. There's the unwanted child where the child just isn't wanted at home, maybe a victim of abuse. And then lastly, there's the idea of accidental filicide where it's an abusive situation that's just gone too far. Now, of those reasons that you enumerated, do certain ones fall on the column of, of, of what the fathers do versus the mothers? Is there certain reasons that are more common for, for the father than for the mother? I don't know that it's broken down by reason, but age certainly is a distinction. So you had mentioned uh, the dumpster. Oftentimes we associate that with what we call neonatified, which is the killing of a brand new infant within the first 24 hours of life. Just because of access, that does tend to be mothers more often and mothers attempt to dispose of the body in a dumpster. Um, I will say in talking about the dumpster, that is um, notable in the fact that a parent, whether it's a father or a mother, is trying to get rid of evidence, which is important uh, in terms of assessing criminal responsibility. Um, stay with us. We've got another guest joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, former special agent in charge at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation worked many, many cases involving children. Trevor Randall is with us. Uh, great to see you, Trevor. Um, let, let's talk about trying to piece together what happened to a child who was discarded in the trash. What are the challenges there first in, in the identification and the recovery of, of the remains? Well, Penny, first of all, um, having been a part of those recovery efforts uh, for similar cases in the past, uh, time is of, is of the essence, as you mentioned. I think, it, needless to say, early on, everyone had concerns uh, when this case uh, was first announced, or when it was first announced that the baby was missing. But certainly, um, at some point, the investigators um, you know, we know that this is a recovery, a forensic recovery uh, initiative, if you will. And when you have that amount of time that passes, especially here in the South, in Georgia, um, it's critical for us, even if we know for sure, okay, at this point, we are looking for a body. Um, you know, this child is no longer with us. Um, evidence is degrading, you know, constantly. The forensic uh, evidence that you hope to get, sometimes uh, some of that evidence um, can be uh, destroyed um, due to the elements when you're dealing with bodies and decomposition and certain things that happen, uh, unfortunately, when, uh, you know, the blood is no longer running through your veins and your heart's pumping. That is always a challenge when you're dealing with outdoor crime scenes and you have um, animal activity, you have insect activity. Uh, we have a really good, you know, forensic specialist when it comes to, um, 
the state of Georgia and a lot of the Metro Medical Examiner's offices, and they're able to determine, you know, injury and wound patterns, even though individuals will try to cover that up, um, you know, by disposing of the body or by burning the body. So we can still tell certain things, but it certainly is a challenge when you're talking about the recovery of remains and we're talking about a small two-year-old. Um, that's just a baby, in my opinion. And that evidence in that body is going to deteriorate very fast. We've got another guest joining us right now, New York City psychotherapist, host of uh, Talking Live and the Bite Size podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Dr. Robbie, uh, great to see you as well. Uh, Dr. Robbie, let's talk about the, the in cases like this, right, where you've got um, a child who is the victim and you have the father who is the suspect. Um, I think the dynamic between mom and dad in some of those cases becomes a, a key part of everything that's happening. Yeah, I mean, you do want to look into the family situation because some of these filicides are contributed by uh, abuse that goes on within the family. So if this particular father was abusive and let's say took it too far and, and killed the child and was trying to cover it up, that's a scenario where perhaps the mother was not aware of the specifics of what happened. But again, it's, it's hard to know. From what I read, it seems like the father is the person they're looking at as far as being responsible for this crime. Absolutely, absolutely. And in many of the cases, I mean, the first trial that, that we covered uh, in the relaunch of CORE TV you know, five years ago involved a father who took the life of little baby Kalia. And there it was exactly what you're talking about was the, the abuse, the disciplining of a baby. Like, like, who disciplines a baby to begin with? That's absurd. Uh, absolutely absurd. Dr. Shara West, let me get back to you on this. So, two years old. You've, you've got a, a situation where um, mom and dad aren't together, okay? If mom and dad aren't together, and there's always a shared responsibility for parenting, obviously um, you want dad to have a, a part in, in your child's life as well. Um, and, and how does, I, I'm, I'm trying, I still can't figure it out, right? The, 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 the mindset, the the moment right does do do we think the moment is is building up and it's a plan is it is it a you know like all of a sudden something happens that could trigger someone there i i, I this this journey i don't get it look at this guy i do consider especially in a situation where the parents are separated and maybe in some sort of custody battle that that partner revenge may play a role in that. So it's very important to assess the relationship between the parents and figure out uh, what factors in their relationship could have played a role in this. And I think it can be both. I think it can be a moment in time where somebody snaps. I also think it can be a premeditated activity. All right, everybody stay where you are. We've got more to talk about on this issue. Plus coming up next hour. In Delphi, Indiana, the fallout continues from the accusations coming from the accused Delphi killer, Richard Allen. He now claims an Odinistic religious cult murdered Abby and Libby in a ritualistic killing and then threatened his family if he didn't confess to the crime in a jailhouse phone call. Tragedy in the Hollywood Hills. Prominent therapist Dr. Amy Hardwick found fatally injured under her balcony. Her ex-boyfriend on trial for her murder. She had had a restraining order against him. He strangled her, lifted her up over the balcony, and dropped her. He never intended on killing her. Is this a case of a jilted lover turned obsessive stalker? The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Coverage continues Tuesday at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Thank you. Amazing little video, amazing little guy. 
Um, what a tragedy. That's uh, baby Josiah, and I want to bring in a special guest now, uh, Josiah's grandma, Larissa uh, Mitchell, is joining us. Larissa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, let's begin here. If you could give us a little snapshot of Josiah, what kind of uh, child, what kind of grandson, what, what was... What was every day like for this little guy? That little guy was my grand shine number two. Because I have three and he was my middle one. He was, I can't even explain. It was just like he was here before his time. Everything that we thought we was teaching him, he already knew. And just to look at him, love him, talk to him, hold him, and everything was just amazing. And it's like so hard to believe that I can't do that anymore. It's like just, it's, I'm still speechless. Yeah. Like, I had a moment today because I'm like, this just can't be real. It just cannot be real. And please know everyone here at Court TV Closing Arguments, um, our, our deepest thoughts are with uh, you and your family as we look at these images of this beautiful child tonight. Um, explain what, what, who he was living with and what the, the, the family situation was uh, at the time that he was reported missing? Well, I'm like, I'm going to start from the kind of beginning, like when my daughter was pregnant with him or whatever, and you know how young fathers are, that's not my kid, that's not my kid, so I raised my kid, my daughters, because I was a single parent of five, so I raised my daughters, is that you take care of your child. You don't beg anybody to do anything for you. You just take care of your child. That's like, that's what a mom does. So she was basically just trying to, he offered to start stepping up, basically. He just offered to start stepping up and stepping in after two years. But the fact that he wasn't at the second birthday or the first birthday, I really didn't have like, he wasn't my favorite person. And then to find, she's living here at home with me, but as normal kids, they spend the night with their friends, they go wherever they go, but they, her address is here with me. But she came to me and she was like, he said that he want to start getting Josiah and spending time with Josiah. So I'm like, okay, prayed about it, prayed about it. I'm still skeptical because that's my grandkids and I would rather have them close to me, like five minutes away. Like if something happened, I can get to them. And that's with my children. But me being a grandma and she's being the mom, I was trying to let her be an adult in her own situation and letting her grow and learn from, like, you know, learn from what she has to go through as being a mom also. So she allowed him to start getting him. But learning, he wouldn't even give her the address to where he lived. She had to meet him at stores to drop her son off to him. For one, that's a no-go for me. Like, I just found this out that she didn't even know where his address was. So I wouldn't have never let my child go. And then, number two, the girlfriend didn't like you because you had a child by him, and I guess it was conceived in their relationship. So there's been another reason I wouldn't let my child go. But me being the good person that I am and tried to raise my kids the same way, she allowed him to go because if the child father wants to be there, you should allow him. But if he doesn't want to be there, don't make him. I mean, and I feel like, yeah, that, I mean, that is the way you're supposed to do it, right? Like, okay, yeah. you're, 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 you and your daughter willing to do everything, you know, with or without, but if dad wants to be there, well, certainly, um, yeah. a, a child should always be better off having both parents in his both life. Parents. And that's how I was trying to look at it. But my last moment was with Josiah is back here on the back porch the weekend before she cooked him. And he was just crying, like just crying. I don't don't know what was wrong with him that day. He just kept crying. So like I do with all my grandkids, when they're in that moment where nobody knows what's wrong with them, I pray. So I'm holding him and I'm praying and I'm kissing his hands and I'm kissing his feet and I'm telling him, God don't comfort whatever's bothering you. Just stop crying. And then she called his daddy on FaceTime and he say, or Josiah's still crying, and he says, you know you're going to have to cut that out when you come up here. You know we ain't having it. 
me not thinking nothing of it or whatever, because I didn't hear anger in his voice when he said it. Or, you know, I just kept my mouth shut. But for some reason, I wish I had no. So I wish I had just said, yeah. no, don't take them. Leave them at home. What do you, what do you think happened? I feel like Josiah was crying and getting on his nerves. And at first it was like, did he strangle him? Did he kill him? Like, you know, what did he do to him? But then it was like rumors of he's, he's giving him um, Percocet. Gave him, gave him Percocets, and I guess he gave him too much. And one of his friends was said that he called him on FaceTime, and he was shaking so, the phone was shaking so bad, and Josiah was crying so bad that he thought he lost connection with him, and he didn't hear from him again. And then we get the call on August the 16th, and that's my oldest child, my oldest daughter's birthday. We get the call at 11-something. Well, he calls my daughter through uh, Facebook, and say that Josiah is missing. And so she runs to me and tell me the same thing. And then his mom call and say, she just called and said Josiah is missing. So my question is, y'all are calling everybody in the family to tell everybody that Josiah is missing, but then not one person called the police. I'm the one that called the police first. Whoa, 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 that. wait a second. Wait, the exactly. child goes missing and the police aren't called? The police is not called. Everybody is called except for the police. When my daughter comes to my room and say, Mama, Mama, he just said just somebody just took Josiah, I called the police from my phone right here at my address. And I drove to the address that he said Josiah got missing from. And it was a police sitting at the store above from the apartment. So I run to the police to tell the police that my grandson just got kidnapped. And they're looking at me like a fool because he's been sitting there patrolling all night and he ain't seen such a thing. So it took them hours before they could believe our story and the only reason they would believe the story is because he called back while we was in front of the police and said the same thing again and that's when they believed us and that's when they took us down for an investigation where we sat in the investigation room for almost 12 hours and his mom called and he was calling and they was recording everything but I'm the first person that called the police I called the police while I was in Temple, Georgia they dispatched me to four different counties because I wasn't in the right county when I told them address we were going up I-20 while I'm on the phone with the police, and he's on the phone back there with her. So I asked him, I said, where is my grandson? And his words was, I can't go to jail, Miss Marie. I can't go to jail, Miss Marie. And he would not tell me where my grandson was, and he stuck to the story of somebody snatched him out the car. Wow. So he's he's he, talking about he, going to jail, and then yeah, he's not he calling the police. And he's not calling the police. I called the police first. I'm the one that made the the, the start. Everything get started. Did he did did he ever look you in the eyes and tell you uh, his his story about what he said happened? I haven't I haven't saw him. The only time I talked to him is when he was on the phone and he was telling my daughter what happened and he was trying to get me to believe what happened. But every address that he said, I was listening. So every address he said. That's the address that I told the police. And some way, somehow, they ended up finding him, getting him, or him turning himself in. And that's when me and my daughter left the, invest the investigating room, and that was around noon the next day. Like, he called around 11 that night saying that he got missing. We got up there within 30 minutes from exit 19 to Flat Show's exit, and that's where I saw the officer that was just sitting at the store. And I hop out the car. I even go to the store to see if they had cameras or anything because he's saying a, a car pulled up from the Aspen Apartments and swerved in front of him and asked him for something, and he didn't have it. So they go to the back seat, and they snatch out my grandson and pull off. And I'm like, you ain't dead either? You ain't dead? You ain't beat up? You ain't hurt? They just took my grandson. That makes no sense. And you, tell, and you telling me that... You don't want to go to jail, but you can't tell me where my grandson is. How's your daughter doing? My daughter is devastated. She is hurt. My daughter is hurt. That was her only child, her first child. Each one of my kids, I had my kids doorstep. Their grandkids was doorsteps. The oldest one has a three-year-old. My Asia, he's two, and my third daughter is one. He just put a gap in my family. Like he just, he just like. 
selfish. So selfish. Because you could have easily called us to come get him, just like you easily called to get him. If he was getting on your nerves, you could have easily called us the same way or called my daughter or called me because at the drop of a dime, I'm coming when it comes to my grandkids. I'm like that with my children, but when they had my grandkids, it's different. It's a different story. So you could have called somebody before you heard it him or whatever you did. We haven't even got the autopsy back to say the day that he actually died or what actually went on, what, what, what's, what's his cause of death. We still haven't got that yet. But I do remember that his mom had said that she talked to him two days prior to, to that. So that would have been the, the 14th, the 13th or the 14th. And she said that she seen him on FaceTime live and well. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, when all of this occurred. And I don't know. Larissa, I know this is a difficult time for your family and, and the emotions have to be all over the place, but we really appreciate yes. you coming on tonight. We're going to continue to follow the story and see when more information comes out so we can figure out uh, exactly what happened to this little angel uh, grandson of yours. Thank you so much, and please give our best to your daughter as well. Thank you. All right. Okay, folks. Um, we've got more to get to. We'll bring back in our experts and talk about another story involving another father in Oregon. As mentioned in the press release, uh, part of this investigation, during this investigation, we were able to find out that Baby Precious uh, was given a name before she passed. Her name was Amara, so I will be referring to her as Amara during, uh, as I speak. The morning of May 28th, 2013, uh, workers at a recycling plant, or recycling center, I should say, in uh, North Portland, uh, found um, the uh, deceased uh, baby Amara on, the, on one of the conveyor belts. Um, going through their daily sorting of recycling materials. And they put in a ton of work uh, trying to track down things like the trucks that had come and dumped, th dumped uh, material, the routes, any video from where the pickups were done. There was, a, as you know, an uh, immense amount of public outcry. Or not public outcry, but public um, request for public assistance um, and things like that. And ultimately, that uh, didn't produce any actionable leads. <clears throat> At that time, also, um, uh, DNA was sent from the baby, um, Amara, and uh, placenta that was found also was sent to OSP Crime Lab to try and see if I could get any matches within the various databases, and that didn't uh, show up anything either. The tragic story of originally baby Precious, this child who was not identified for 10 years. These remains were found in, in the recycling conveyor belt. Another baby uh, killed and tossed away. Uh, Detective Brandon McGuire from the Portland Police Bureau um, now believes they have solved this case. Take a listen. We sent off samples in May of 2019. Um, they did their initial uh, processing of that and uploading it into the consumer databases and were not able to get any uh, close relative matches that would generate anything. So um, the case sort of went back on the shelf for a little bit. Um, in December of 2020, um, Bodhi called me up and said uh, there had been new submissions to the databases that now they were able to find a pretty close uh, familial match. Uh, unfortunately, that match um, was uploaded anonymously, so we had no idea who this person was. Um, we did have an email address, however, and through that we were able to track this person down. Um, and then we had another roadblock, this person was adopted. So we had no actual biological family to work with uh, with them. So. The next um, six or eight months were spent um, going through uh, the courts to get access to adoption records in Utah and Idaho. Um, and that uh, ultimately in July of 2021, that got us to identifying um, a local family that was involved in this. As you know, uh, a man named Alnath Omar Oliver has been indicted for a number of charges. He goes by Omar, so if I, uh, if I, uh, mentioned him as Omar, the suspect is who I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, and ultimately what we found was Omar, uh, 10 years ago when he was uh, in his 40s, had a relationship with a then 15-year-old uh, who, for obvious reasons, we will not be identifying. Um, that relationship produced a child. 
Amara. Uh, and um, the uh, circumstances surrounding her birth that night um, and Omar's actions and then her death are what resulted in the um, uh, um, charges for, uh, for Omar. Mother is still alive. She's very aware of this. Uh, she testified at grand jury. Uh, she knows what's going on. Um, but uh, yes, and she is the relationship between Omar and her is sort of the uh, the nexus for that rape three charge that you saw in the. Um, so not only is she juvenile, but she's also a juvenile sex assault victim. So um, hence we won't be providing any more details about her. One of the things I can tell you is the mother of the child is not aware that her child was deceased. She has believed from day one that Omar had taken the child to a hospital. Um, and so this, this did not provide that sense of resolution that we normally seek. This really sort of devastated um, this family, unfortunately. From the moment that um, the defendant was aware of the pregnancy, he prevented both the mother from going to uh, seek any medical care, medical care, prenatal or otherwise, um, including after in the immediate, like she gave birth on his floor um, and he prevented her from going to seek any medical attention. He then took the child uh, from that, uh, that uh, from his apartment um, and uh, uh, in the course of walking to a hospital, the baby passed, um, and he, when he found the baby unresponsive, he refused to take that baby to the hospital. Wow. Incredible investigation, but really uh, an incredibly tragic story, but very layered. Let's bring back in our guest still with us, uh, Villicide expert, staff psychiatrist, Dr. Sarah West former special agent in charge, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Trabor Randall, and psychotherapist, host of Talking Live, bite-sized podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Uh, Dr. Sarah West, uh, your, your thoughts about um, this father accused of doing what he did. Looks like the motivation was trying to keep this entire relationship with the underage mother um, completely uh, secret. Sure. So this situation, as you highlighted, is pretty unusual for a paternal or father uh, responsible for a child's death in the first 24 hours of birth, because, of course, the mother would have access to that information. Now, this was kind of the perfect storm in that the mom was 15 years old, the victim of abuse, of sexual trauma, and therefore she was not in a position to be able to defend herself or her uh, newborn against an older man who had uh, been abusing her. Trabor Randall, the investigation here, unreal, uh, what they had to overcome. Absolutely, from the word go. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, having worked these cases where uh, there's a, a baby that I'm discarded, uh, many times full terms, this happens more often than people would ever realize. And you start from zero. What do you have? Obviously, you have an infant, you have DNA. But if you do not have someone to tie this baby to, um, either in the community or someone coming forward saying, hey, I know an individual that was pregnant and now we don't see a baby and she's not pregnant anymore, unless you have something like that, um, you really have nothing. So Kudos to the investigator, stay in the course, excellent police work. And as you heard him mention, even though um, this uh, forensic gene genealogy has really changed the game, it has been a great game changer um, since it's come on the scene. That's still just the developed for them that there was some, they found a family connection or they found an individual, but then they have to go through other hoops to identify this person um, due to uh, the person having been adopted. So they stayed the course. And again, once you identify an, a person who has the same DNA as this victim child, you still have to further develop that lead and get someone to give you information concerning who was pregnant or who um, the father might have been to lead you to these two individuals we're speaking of now. Um, you see the manslaughter charge, obviously, because um, that's more of a situation where, as they mentioned, uh, the baby died at some point prior to uh, going to the hospital, but um, based on his uh, inactions, 
um, you know, this child is no longer here. And uh, in addition to the other charges where obviously there was evidence to prove or based on statements by now the known victim, the other victim, the mother, that she was a victim of abuse in this case as well. But excellent police work and, and uh, you know, making sure this cold case um, didn't go uh, unsolved. Absolutely. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, there was something really dark going on um, behind closed doors and, and in the way this man was abusing this, uh, this teenage girl. Yeah, and um, as the doctor was saying, it is very unusual for men to be associated with neonaticide in that usually it's the mothers, the, the men don't have contact. So this man was clearly covering up a crime. And we know when we look at the studies of filicide and we look at men, and there aren't a tremendous amount of studies because of the gender bias or over focus on women that there are multi multiple factors. So this man had a character disorder, uh, might have had a mood disorder and, um, you know, didn't want this child. Perhaps there were financial issues and he was covering up a crime. So here we see a uh, confluence of all of these issues contributing to his actions. Uh, Dr. Robbie Ludwood, Trevor Randall, Dr. Sarah West, thank you all so much. Appreciate your very valuable time.